Good morning. A very warm welcome to the worship of God. Good to see you all here today. Uh, welcome to any visitors with us today. And it's particularly great to see all the ladies of the guild here uh, spread in front of us uh, for the dedication which will take this part of the service today, the dedication of the new Hoyk South Guild. After the Guild dedication, uh, Sheila and Sheila Cook and Ellis Ray will go through with the children to the hall for Sunday Club. Uh, Sheila's given me an intimation as well about the shoe boxes. Thank you to everyone who's already got involved with the Samaritan's Purse Operation Christmas Child Shoebox Appeal, either by filling a shoebox or donating items or money. Next Sunday is the deadline as the boxes will be taken up to Edinburgh at the beginning of the following week so they can get checked and start their journey abroad. So there's still time to fill a box or give a donation. Items can be left on the table as you go through to the large hall, you'll see all the stuff there. Uh, items can be left there and there's also a bowl for money donations. It costs five pounds to send each box so all donations are welcome. The Sunday Club children will be hearing the story of the Good Samaritan today and will be filling shoe boxes this week and next. Thanks again for your help. After the service, tea, coffee, juice through in the hall. Reach through that door there. Do stay if you can for time of fellowship. This evening at six o'clock we have a cafe style service, continuing our series in the gifts of the Spirit. Looking to get to teaching this evening. Next Sunday, our remembrance service here at Hoyk South is at 9.30, note the different time, 9.30. That's so that those who wish to go to the remembrance service in Wilton Lodge Park afterwards can do so. I'm told that the remembrance service that starts in the park starts at 10.52, putting its time to the minute, so we get to 11 o'clock at the right time, so to speak. Uh, but there's a parade beforehand. I think it leaves at 10.30 or 10.45 or something. You can join in with uh, 10.52 like that. It's like a train time, isn't it? And then 3 o'clock up at Roberton for the short service there and at the War Memorial. Uh, 3 o'clock, a change of time as well from last year, next Sunday afternoon. On Tuesday, 5th November, from 5.30 till 6, we have our town-wide prayer gathering in, here in the lounge in Hoyk South. Don't forget about that. This is an important coming together monthly, first Tuesday of the month, 5.30 till 6. We've a good numbers coming along to pray, to pray for our town, open to the Holy Spirit as we uh, gather together to pray for God to do His work here. And a reminder to Kirk Session members that the session meeting is at 7 o'clock on Tuesday, 5th November in the Clue Road Hall. Uh, so remember, remember the 5th November. <laughs> the prayer meeting is on Thursday evening, 7th November at 7 o'clock and Zoom open to all. Just ask me for the link if you need that. So let us worship God. Some words from Isaiah 33, 5 and 6. The theme for the Guild uh, this year is Sure Foundation, so this, these verses refer to that. So let's say these words together as our call to worship. The Lord is exalted, for He dwells on high. He will fill Zion with His justice and righteousness. He will be the sure foundation for your times, a rich store of salvation and wisdom and knowledge. The fear of the Lord is the key to this treasure. Amen. So let's sing uh, our opening praise, which is a joyful one. Uh, Come, people of the risen King, Stuart Townend, him. Let's stand to sing this together. Come 
It makes you feel like dancing. That's all right. We sing with joy to the Lord. Let us come with our prayers now. Lord God, our Father in heaven, we do come rejoicing in you this morning. Whether our joy is in the morning sun or we are weeping through the night, for your good and your love endures forever. Your mercies are new every morning. You are perfect and unchanging in your justice and love. 
and the depth of who you are and your nature and character, Lord. It's beyond our ability to take in, but we worship you as God and give you the glory from the depths of our hearts, all glory, honor, and praise, and worship and thanks be yours now and forever. We rejoice in Jesus Christ, your Son, our risen Lord. He died for our sins and took them away as we trust in Him, and His blood continues to cleanse us from all sin as we confess Him to you. He rose in victory and is seated at your right hand in glory, and He will come from there to judge the living and the dead. He will return to reign one day. Oh, we bless you and rejoice in your Son. In your Son, you have blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. And we rejoice in the Holy Spirit for His presence and work in our lives and in your church. We welcome Him here today. Thank you that where two or three come together in the name of Jesus. There you are right in the midst of us. By your Spirit, Lord, come and work in us today. We praise you for the reality, life, love, and power of Jesus. He brings right into our experience. So, Father, as the people of the risen King, with all your people throughout the world and throughout the ages, with the angels and with all creation, we worship you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. Amen. So we ask your blessing now, Father, as we gather as your people here this morning. We pray you will bless us as we praise you and pray and engage with your word and in our guild dedication. Be glorified in everything, and may your good, pleasing, and perfect will be done in and through this time of worship, which we give over to you now. And we bring our prayers in Jesus' name, continuing now in the prayer Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, Sheila's going to come. Um, Sheila Cook, she's got a lot going on today. She's reading because she is the new convener. Uh, of Hoyk South Church Guilds. So she is going to bring us our Bible reading. So the reading is from Acts chapter 28 um, at verse 11 to 31, and you can find it on page 1126. After three months, we put out to sea in a ship that had wintered in the island. It was an Alexandrian ship with the figurehead of the twin gods Castor and Pollux. We put in at Syracuse and stayed there three days. From there, we set sail and arrived in Regium. The next day, the south wind came up and on the following day, we reached Puteoli. There, we found some brothers and sisters who invited us to spend a week with them. And so we came to Rome. The brothers and sisters there had heard that we were coming and they traveled as far as the Forum of Appius and the Three Taverns to meet us. At the sight of these people, Paul thanked God and was encouraged. When we got to Rome, Paul was allowed to live by himself with a soldier to guard him. Three days later, he called together the local Jewish leaders. When they had assembled, Paul said to them, my brothers, although I have done nothing against our people or against the customs of our ancestors, I was arrested in Jerusalem and handed over to the Romans. They examined me and wanted to release me because I was not guilty of any crime deserving death. The Jews objected, 
So I was compelled to make an appeal to Caesar. I certainly did not intend to bring any charge against my own people. For this reason, I have asked to see you and to talk with you. It is because of the hope of Israel that I am bound with this chain. They replied, we have not received any letters from Judea concerning you or, and none of our people who have come from there has reported or said anything bad about you. But we want to hear what your views are, for we know that people everywhere are talking against this sect. They arranged to meet Paul on a certain day and came in even larger numbers to the place where he was staying. He witnessed to them from morning till evening, explaining about the kingdom of God, and from the law of Moses and from the prophets, he tried to persuade them about Jesus. Some were convinced by what he said, but others would not believe. They disagreed among themselves and began to leave after Paul had made this final statement. The Holy Spirit spoke the truth to your ancestors when he said through Isaiah the prophet, go to this people and say, you will be ever hearing but never understanding. You will be ever seeing but never perceiving. For this people's heart has become calloused. They hardly hear with their ears and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, he understand with their hearts, and turn, and I would heal them. Therefore, I want you to know that God's salvation has been sent to the Gentiles, and they will listen. For two whole years, Paul stayed there in his own rented house and welcomed all who came to him to see him. He proclaimed the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. Amen. And thanks be to God for his word. The uh, strategy for the guild is um, let us build a house. So we're going to sing a song. I understand the guild have been singing, I'm sure. For I'm building a people of power. So uh, let's uh, sing that together. We'll sing it twice. Well, it'll come up on the screen. So this morning we're delighted to have the the guild with us sitting right in the center of the church here. It's good that the union of the guilds of St. Mary's No Parish, Trinity, and TV and Roberton has worked so smoothly, and uh, the New Hoyk South Guild, I understand, has around 55 members, so that's very encouraging. Here's what the guild is. 
The Church of Scotland Guild is a movement within the Church of Scotland which invites and encourages both women and men to commit their lives to Jesus Christ and enables them to express their faith in worship, prayer, and action. We're grateful to Shula Cook, the new Guild convener, and the committee who share in leading the Guild and making the arrangements for it, and to all the members of the Guild for all you do as part of the Church Fellowship here. So, blessings on you. The Guild strategy for the three-year cycle for 2024 to 2027 is, as I said, let us build a house. And under that strategy, the theme this year is sure foundations, but those for the next two years being living stones and beyond the walls. All great themes. The Guild do choose good themes to reflect on and, and build their programs on. We're going to be looking at this year's theme of sure foundations at the Guild meeting on 19th November when I visit, so I'm not looking at that today. So we thank God for you, the Guild, and we ask Him to bless you together in the new session, which has just begun. So let us dedicate the Guild to the Lord in prayer. First, we'll have a prayer for the Guild, beginning with the prayer written a few years ago now by Esme Duncan, a former national convener. It's a lovely prayer. I've used it before, but it's a great prayer. Uh, the words for that prayer, uh, and then we'll have a, I'll pray for the Guild in that way, and then we'll have a prayer for the Guild to stand and say together, and Sheila will lead you in that when we get to that point. But first of all, a prayer for the Guild. Let us pray. Loving Heavenly Father, we thank You for all the ways in which You show Your love for us, for the beauty of Your creation, the first flowers of springtime, the warmth of summer sunshine, the mellow fruitfulness of autumn, the crisp clarity of winter days, for the joy of family and friends, the shared laughter, the happy memories, the comfort we receive in times of sorrow and sadness, for the fellowship we find within Your church as we worship, witness, and serve together. Most of all, Lord, we thank You for sending Your Son to live here on earth. He lived a perfect life, yet He understands our human faults and feelings. In obedience, He went to the cross that we might know forgiveness. He rose again on the third day that we might rise to newness of life. Heavenly Father, we thank You for Your limitless love. Father, we ask Your richest blessing to rest upon each member of the Guild here before You. Thank You for each one of them, for their life and faith, and for the fellowship and friendship they find together. Thank You that through that fellowship their faith in You and their love for You can be strengthened. May that happen more and more. May they walk in faith together. May they love and care for each other deeply. And may they be able to serve You in word and action in whatever ways You desire, including through the Guild projects they support so generously. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So, I could I ask the Guild, if you're able, to, to stand now? And we'll have the prayer on the screen, and Sheila's going to lead you in that. Yes. So, God bless you all. Bless the guild. So, we're going to sing a hymn of dedication now, Take My Life and Let It Be.
feel the challenge of these words as we sing them in their depths, depths of commitment of which they sing. Lord, may it be so. Let us pray. Come with our prayer of dedication and for others. Lord God, our Father, we give you praise and thanks from the depths of our hearts for the gift of Jesus Christ, your Son. He alone is a sure foundation for our lives, for your church, and for everything. We rejoice in the eternal life we have through faith in him, through his death and resurrection. In response to your love, enable us, to all, enable us all to dedicate ourselves to you, offering our bodies to you as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to you, our reasonable service. And we dedicate to you our offerings. They are tokens of our giving you all we are and have. And it is our delight to give. In your hands may these gifts be multiplied and may your work continue and deepen and grow. We ask your blessing, Lord, today in the Guild. We give you thanks for the good start to the United Guild and ask that it will go on from strength to strength. Guide and inspire those who plan for the future and encourage those who deal with the day-to-day -day tasks which make it all possible. Thank you for Sheila, the committee, and the members. May they know your will for now and for the future and be blessed in their fellowship together in Jesus Christ, your Son. We pray for the projects being supported by the National Guild over the next three years from the beginning of next year. Bibles for Bairns, a project of Scottish Bible Society to allow young children to have Bible stories read to them by their parents. Build My Church, a project of bare necessities for Bulgaria to plant a church in the city of Sliven. Operation Hope, a project of Release International to provide practical care to Christian communities in Upper Egypt. And Playful Beginnings, a project of Crossreach to help vulnerable families in Edinburgh and Glasgow. Thank you for each of these projects that the Guild has chosen to support them. May each of these projects be blessed by you, Father, and may the support given through the Guild be a great help to them in their work. Sovereign Lord, this is a broken world through sin. We see that in so many ways. Today we pray for the people of Southeast Spain with the devastating flooding. Have mercy, Lord. Please may those who have lost loved ones find your comfort. May those who are injured and those who have lost homes, businesses, and all they have look to you and call to you and have the practical care and help they need. Empower the troops, police, and volunteers in their work in the aftermath of this flooding, including searching for people, restoring vital supplies and services, and in recovery and rebuilding work. And we ask that the severe rain will not recur. Sovereign Lord, please have your hand on the outcome of the United States presidential election. There is much about the process and the polarization and the choice of candidates, which to us is perplexing. But we ask that you overrule it all for your purposes, for that nation and the world, and for your gospel purposes, for the sake of peace, justice, and what is right, for your kingdom. In your mercy, hear our prayer. And God, our Father, in the quietness we bring to you, those among us unknown to us who need our prayers. We think of those who are unwell in body or mind, those who await test results or who have received unexpected news and diagnosis, those who await or are going through or have had surgery or treatment, those for whom no further treatment is possible. We name them before you, Father, in the quietness. We ask for your hand of power, healing power on them. May they look to you and trust in you. We pray for mothers and their babies about to be born. May you keep them safe and may they trust in you. And we ask your comfort for those who grieve the death of a loved one or those for whom this is around their anniversary of the date of the death of a loved one. May they know the comfort your son promises to those who mourn. 
And may they, through faith in Jesus, be able to hope in you. And now, Father, in the quietness, we bring our personal concerns to you and our personal thanksgivings to you. Thank you, Father, for hearing our prayers. We bring them all in Jesus' name. Amen. So now, before we come to God's Word, we're going to sing, uh, My Hope is Built in Nothing Less. It's the modern version with the cornerstone chorus. Stand to sing.
Very good. Technology is working. We come today to the end of our journey through Acts, um, through these chapters that aren't, I don't think, so often um, preached on, um, and Paul reaches Rome. It's been a long time coming uh, to Rome at last as our uh, theme. Paul had planned to come to Rome. He had made these plans before, and he says back in Acts 19.21, when he was back in Ephesus, what's now Turkey, he had said that uh, he planned to visit Rome after traveling to Jerusalem to take back the offering there that had been given to the folk who were struggling with um, poverty there in Jerusalem and so on. So after he'd gone to Rome, he was going to come to, after he'd come to Jerusalem, he was going to come to Rome. He also shared in his letter when he wrote to the church in Rome, uh, his plan to go to Spain after he'd been to Jerusalem and on the way to Spain, call in, as you do in, in Rome, to see them. But as we know, our plans can change, can't they? So more importantly, the Lord Jesus Christ Himself had promised to Paul that He was going to get to Rome. Paul was in prison in Jerusalem. He'd been arrested after the riot that broke out when the Jewish people accused him wrongly of defiling the temple. He was arrested by the Roman authorities, really for his own safety, apart from anything else. And he was in his cell, that's C-E-L-L, -L, not in his, uh, Glasgow, in his cell. He was in his cell, and he had a visit from Christ himself. The risen Christ appeared to him, stood, stood beside him, and said, as you have testified about me in Jerusalem, so you must also testify about me in Rome. There's a word from the Lord directly to Jesus, so it was going to happen. The Lord has said it. But look at what has happened since. <laughs> a whole succession of trials, plots against his life, being held in custody for two years, his appeal to the emperor, then the epic sea voyage across the Mediterranean we've been looking at in recent weeks. Should get the map up, shouldn't we? There's the map. Uh, can you see that clearly? Can you see the green line from Jerusalem in the bottom left, right up to Rome on the top right. But as all these things were happening, do you think Paul ever wondered, am I ever going to get to Rome? Is it ever going to happen? What's really going on here? This is an awful mess. But God came to Paul right in the middle of the storm. See the zigzaggy bit there? That's a storm. When he was in the middle of that storm, an angel of the Lord, and I love how the angel describes himself because it, it is the guild motto. The angel of the God, or Paul describes the angel as the angel of the God who, whose I am and whom I serve. Is that right? Is that the right way around? Whose I am and whom I serve. The angel of that God Paul, the God whom Paul loved and lived for and served and belonged to, came to him right in the middle of the storm and said, you, are, you must stand trial before Caesar, and God has graciously given you the lives of all who sail with you. And that's what happened. They were shipwrecked off Malta, and they swam ashore and all the rest of it. God's promise was fulfilled. Not one life was lost. But now, let's look at Paul's journey to Rome. 
sometime in February, uh, after three months uh, wintering in Malta, Paul, his companions, and the other prisoners uh, set sail again in a ship from Alexandria that was heading to Rome. Interestingly, we are told it had a figurehead. It's interesting, it's just the twin brothers in Greek. But in Greek mythology, these twin brothers are the sons of Zeus or Jupiter. That's Castor and Pollux. So the, our translation has Castor and Pollux, these twin gods. They were the gods of navigation and patrons of seafarers. Uh, so this figurehead was, I suppose, like a lucky charm to keep you safe when you were sailing. Um, remember Luis Palau telling a story of getting on a plane and somebody said, I'll be all right. I've got a lucky rabbit's foot to keep me safe. <laughs> and he said, it made me feel like getting off the plane. <laughs> this was the world Paul inhabited, the world of these other gods and uh, false gods, and all kinds of powers and things that folk believed in, and it is no different to us today, is it? There's lots of things in our culture that are uh, run counter to what we believe as Christians, are out of kilter with it, and we need to be able… Well, Halloween's an example. Hard to negotiate for parents, for example, but in, we have to live in this world but we're not of it, and that creates a tension unavoidably. We're in the world and not of it, but we need to be in it and not of it. We can't kind of escape into monastic existence, nor can we simply absorb ourselves in everything that's going on, become like everyone else, because then we're denying who we are. So we need to be in the world and not of it. So Paul was happy to be in this ship, Castor and Pollux, no problem. Uh, he belonged to God. He knew his life was in God's hands, and he trusted in him, not in these two twin gods of seafarers. They arrive in Syracuse, the capital of Sicily. Let's get the map back up again. They arrive in Syracuse, the capital of Sicily. Do you see it there? Yeah, on the east coast of Sicily. Uh, and stay there three days before they're off again, with the wind against them, as the word used for set sail in our text refers to tacking, zigzagging into the wind. Uh, they reach Regium on the toe of Italy, and they then have a favorable south wind that arises, and they make excellent progress, and they cover the 180 miles or so up the coast of Italy to Puteoli in the Bay of Naples. 180 miles in just over a day. It's pretty good going. The ship had a week's stop there, and there's lovely things in this passage. Paul and his companions found some Christian believers there, and they must have, they said, stay with us for the week. The ship had to stop for a week for some, re a week for some reason. So Paul and his companions, I'm sure, had a great time of fellowship, enjoying the hospitality of these Christian brothers and sisters there in Puteoli. And the next verse is wonderful. It's so understated. Just the end of verse 14, page 1126, if you want to follow this in the Pew Bible, which is always good to do, it says, and so we came to Rome. And so we came to Rome. It's, praise God, it's been a long time coming, but here we are. Luke was there, so we came to Rome. God is working His purposes out as year succeeds to year. We're going to sing that at the end of the service. It's not the way Paul expected to get there. It's been a rather messier, zigzaggier route than he would ever have anticipated. And he's here as a prisoner, not as a free man. But it's all in the providence of God, and He is here. Just as the Lord Jesus said He would be there, He is there. Isn't that wonderful? Paul will say in a letter to the Ephesians that he wrote in Rome, God works out everything in conformity with the purpose of His will. God works out everything in conformity with the purpose of His will. Hear the size of that statement. God is that big a God. 
It's not a wee personal God that deals with us. It is, works out everything in a conformity with the purpose of His will. And his letter to the Romans written early in his ministry writes these profound words, all things, not just some things, all things work together for good for those who love God and are called according to His purposes. These are huge promises. Do you need to hear them today? I do. We will get where God wants us to be. He is working out His purposes for our lives, but it can be in ways that we would not expect uh, and causing us to go through things that we would not choose to go through, but nonetheless, He's still working out His purposes. Hold on to that. All things, hear that, work together for good for those who love God and are called according to His purposes. A sure and certain promise. We can trust Him. All the promises He has made in His Word, He will keep. We can rest in Him. Whatever's going on in your life and mine just now, under the shadow of His wings, what a lovely picture. I saw a photograph recently of a bird with its wings and the wee chick chicks there. We can rest there, whatever's going on. Uh, he knows what he's doing, even when it can be hard to see that. He will lead you all the way, and he will lead you all the way home, ultimately, whatever direction it takes to get there, through Jesus Christ our Lord. The actual arrival of Paul and his friends in Rome is lovely. They go by land now from Puteoli up uh, the Appian Way, uh, straight Roman road to, to Rome. But the Christian believers in Rome hear of their coming, and uh, they travel south to meet them, some of them going 30-plus miles to uh, the three taverns, and some of them going even farther, farther, another 10 miles to the Forum of Appius, just to meet Paul and his companions. I think of Sheila and the dog uh, coming on occasion to meet me at Kirkhill Station when I came home from work in the early days of our marriage when we were living in Glasgow there in Campus Lang, meeting me halfway there from the train with the dog. Or we might think of international arrivals at an airport and the strong emotion there is as people meet people they have maybe haven't seen for years or seen at all. Well, these, these Christian believers, what an emotional meeting it must have been for Paul and for them to meet these dear brothers and sisters in Christ. Paul knew some of them, including Priscilla and Aquila from elsewhere when they'd been in um, Corinth, wasn't it? But most of them he hadn't met. He'd written his great letter to them, but he's never been to Rome. And Luke tells us, at the sight of these people, Paul thanked God and was encouraged. Wonderful. He met his goal. That was Paul's journey to Rome and they traveled up to Rome together. Paul was able to live in his own rented house, his own expense, but he had a guard with him who'd be chained to him, I understand, when he left the house. This custodia militaris, midway between penal detention in prison and uh, supervised freedom. Uh, he would end up with kind of house arrest, if you like, but a lot of freedom there. He was awaiting trial before Nero after all. So that's Paul's journey to Rome. Now we turn to Paul's ministry in Rome. It's a strange, you might think it's a strange ending to, to Acts, what happens here, but it's really very significant, uh, important, obviously. Uh, what does Paul do first in Rome? He doesn't dive into a series of meetings with the Christians, a whole series of church meetings. <laughs> he after only three days' recovery from his journey, he calls a meeting of the Jewish leaders. Not the Christians, the Jewish leaders. But it's not so surprising, really, for that's been his approach wherever he's gone. And here we see it replicated right at the end of Acts. He says, the gospel is for the Jew first and then for the Gentile. Usually when he was rejected. He says in Romans 1.16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. He's so keen to engage with his own people who he loves. He explains to them about his arrest because of the opposition in Jerusalem, although he'd done nothing wrong. He explains about 
the um, Romans arresting him, uh, uh, but they decided that he was innocent and that he has nothing against Jewish people. That's amazing after all he's been through. Uh, he had to appeal to Caesar because they refused his release from these series of trials, but he remains a loyal Jew. He loves his people. We see his heart for his own um, fellow Jewish people coming through in his letter, particularly the letter to Rome, 9 to 11, chapters 9 to 11, where he's this huge heart's desire for Jewish people to come to faith in Jesus. I'd like to be, rather be cut off so that they could come in, he says. So it's because of his hope in the Messiah that he's there in Rome because he had to appeal to Caesar and he was opposed by the Jews, and it's because of his hope in the Messiah that he is speaking to the Jew, Jewish people now, and he speaks to them, and they come and see him. Great numbers gather in his house, these Jewish folk, and he spends a whole day with them. And we see what he majors on. He majors on the kingdom of God and Jesus, funnily enough, and the two are so closely related, of course. So he would explain to them that the kingdom of God is where God rules, God's rule breaking into human history in Jesus. And he would testify to the reality of that that isn't just words, but a reality he has seen and he's known in his own life and the lives of others and through Jesus' ministry and through God's people, through God's work, through the work of the gospel, he testified to the kingdom of God his experience of it, his knowledge of it, the kingdom of God coming in Jesus. He spoke about the kingdom of God, but he also speaks about Jesus. He tried to convince them about Jesus. You know, that's so straightforward, isn't it? He tried to convince them about Jesus. Do you know? Oh, you do know, don't you? But it needs to be said that the Christian faith is all about Jesus. You know that. It's all about Jesus. So Paul tried to convince them about Jesus. He does that by, by doing two things. He says, look, here's this man, Jesus, who walked this earth, who did these things, the historical Jesus, man, Christ Jesus, in a particular time and place, flesh and blood, God come as one of us. Here he is, what he did, taught miracles, his death, his resurrection, everything about him. He does that, and then he also speaks about the person that was spoken about in the Old Testament Scriptures, their Scriptures, the Hebrew Scriptures, the Law and the Prophets, the major parts of what we call the Old Testament. This Messiah that gets pointed forward to again and again all the way through, this one who was going to come, the perfect King, the suffering servant, what He would do, what He would say, His death, His resurrection, and said, look, these two are the same. This Jesus is that Messiah, Jesus is the Messiah. He convinced them, sought to convince them about Jesus who brings in the kingdom of God. Paul's emphasis is essentially the same as Jesus' emphasis. When Jesus begins his ministry at the start of Mark's gospel, he says, the time has come, the kingdom of God is near, repent and believe the good news. Here's Jesus saying, I am here, I have come, the Messiah, the kingdom comes in me. I am that one. The kingdom of God is brought in as people trust in me and are brought under the perfect uh, rule of God by being united to me, the perfect Son. Repent and turn to Him in faith from your sin. Paul's preaching caused a split. <laughs> uh, some were convinced, but others just would not believe, and there's a kind of stubbornness in that statement. They would not believe. So just as they're about to leave, Paul makes a solemn final statement. He says this, the Holy Spirit spoke the truth to your ancestors when he said through Isaiah the prophet, and he quotes from Isaiah 6, 9 to 10. Can you see that all right on the screen? Is that big enough to see? <clears throat> Uh, 
This is the first sermon, the beginning of the first sermon that Isaiah the prophet was given to preach when he said, here I am, send me. When he saw this sermon, he knew what God wanted him to say. You might have imagined him saying, can I have something easier for my first time speaking to the people? You know, just so, so that I can build up good relationships with them. Eh? But no, what's he given? He's given this word that distinguishes between hearing with the ears and seeing with the eyes and really understanding in the heart and perceiving and knowing what is being said. And he more or less has told Isaiah to make this people's hearts calloused, make them not be able to hear, make them close their eyes, because they have closed their eyes and their ears and hearts to God. And Isaiah comes with this word just as at the cusp of hardening themselves against God, and he, his word kind of confirms them in that really hard message. It also calls them back, but it had that effect. So Paul quotes that very, very serious, solemn message. Now, just as he's met with these Jewish Christian, Jewish, not Jewish Christian, Jewish people in Rome, What a graphic picture we have in these words of the inward life of those who reject God. Their hearts are hardened. Do you see that? Calloused. Their ears are shut up so they cannot, will not listen to God. Their eyes are blinded to the reality of who God is. How are you today in your heart? Is there any hardness of heart in you? Spiritual deafness, not wanting to hear God. Oh, spiritual blindness. Turning a blind eye to God. We'll seek the Lord about that right now if it's you. It's a dangerous situation to be in. The focus on what Paul is saying here is on the Jews who reject the gospel. This, your hearts, you're ever hearing but never understanding, you're ever seeing but never perceiving. That's the focus here on those who have refused to believe. And as he said these words, and he said, I'm turning now to the Gentiles before they left, and they will listen. Nonetheless, look at these words again. It struck me as I, just as I kind of noticed this, the whole of that verse, these two verses, is quoted there. And do you see the structure of it? Just a wee bit of literary observation for you. Do you see the structure of verse 27? You see you've got heart, ears, and eyes, yeah? And then you've got eyes, ears, and hearts. It's called a chiastic structure, a cross-shaped structure where you get A, B, C, C, B, A. So you're led down into that. This is their situation. Their hearts are hard, their ears are closed, their eyes are closed. Otherwise, you know, if that wasn't the case, and then we led back out again, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with our hearts. It comes back the other way, you see, and finishes in turn, and I would heal them. So we've got the process of coming back to God. If only, if only that could happen, and that can only happen by the grace of God and the Spirit of God working in someone to, to make that change. Jesus spoke about that, and that's why He spoke in parables. It needs His own uh, revelation to come into people, and if that happens, Eyes are open to see God, are hearing His Word, understand with our hearts, turn and I would heal. And this coming back to God, do you know that in your own life? Yes, God brings us back to find His healing and salvation. So these words of Isaiah would ring in the ears of these Jewish people as they left that day, and who knows, maybe they would be the means of drawing them to faith in Jesus. Do you love Jesus today? Is your heart open to Him? Do you delight in His Word, in seeing Him, knowing Him, 
for yourself and you want that more and more? Is that you today? Pray it is to grow in our relationship with God, to trust Him more. We see through a glass darkly, don't we? But we want to see Him more and know Him more. We want to grow in our relationship with God. We want to wake up spiritually and become what God wants us to be. Paul prays in his letter to the Ephesians, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened. I keep asking that God will give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know Him better. Amen. May it be so for each one of us. The eyes of our hearts enlightened to know the hope and the riches, the glory of power of Jesus. How are we doing? There's so much in this. Uh, Paul stayed in Rome for two years. Many came. There was freedom there. And we're told he carried on with these two themes, the kingdom of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. And he had an open door. Many came, and he ministered to them all. And there were people who were converted. And Onesimus, the runaway slave, he was converted through Paul's ministry in Rome. I'm sure many others were. There would be Gentiles and Jews coming to him. He had that ministry, and it lasted two years. He wrote the four prison epistles, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon. What a rich heritage we have today because Paul was two years imprisoned in Rome. And Luke finishes the words, actually, the last two words in Acts are, with all boldness and without hindrance. Verse 31, he proclaimed the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ. With all boldness and without hindrance. That's how Luke finishes his two works, Luke Acts. He finishes Acts with these words, and that's quite, is, is telling. Paul was bold. Uh, he didn't hold back in what he said. He spoke the whole truth of God, and that's costly. We know that because we're going to say things that some people will not like. But if you don't do that, how can it have an effect? If you only say the things that people want to hear, he was bold. He also didn't make what he was saying vague and complex and difficult. I hope I don't do that in my preaching. Seek not to. Uh, He made it clear as clear could be. He wasn't vague and politically clever in the way he said things, so it could be taken in different ways, and he could say, oh, I didn't mean that. And he wasn't afraid of the consequences. He was bold. John Stott says he was candid, clear, and confident. That's what it means to be bold. And he was preaching without hindrance. Nothing in Paul and the way he spoke stopped the message being shared, but there was nothing in his situation that prevented him preaching, and that's really amazing. There was no ban from the Roman authorities. He was chained to a Roman soldier. He was in prison, but it didn't stop him doing what he was doing because the Word of God is never chained. He had freedom of speech. So, but that's how Acts finishes. He preached the kingdom of God and the Lord Jesus, taught about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. Why does Luke finish his acts like that? Because he is saying, here's an open door for the gospel into the Roman Empire and the world here as Acts finishes. And here are we now. The door is opened for that parallel there. For us, we have this gospel too, and we have to proclaim it. This is a challenge to me and to you. We have to proclaim it with that same boldness and without hindrance. In the freedom we definitely still have, make full use of it. We and the whole church need to hear that challenge. That's how Acts ends. A call fully to grasp the freedom we have, boldly to communicate the good news of Jesus Christ in our day, here and wherever we find ourselves. But there's something else, just a wee postscript, if you bear with me. 
Paul must eventually have been tried before the emperor Nero, and we understand he was released. So his life didn't end here at the end of Acts. Sometimes you can think that. Uh, and it seems he engaged in missionary travels for around another couple of years before being rearrested and martyred in Rome in A.D. 64. So in that time, he wrote the pastoral epistles, Timothy, Titus. He wrote these letters. He wrote to Timothy, and in First Timothy, Second Timothy, four verse seven, he has these moving words. Just before his martyrdom, martyrdom, he says this: "I have fought the good fight." I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. What glorious words. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. May each one of us be able sincerely to say that as we trust in Christ when we come to the end of our days on earth, uh, that we will be able to say, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the the faith. Until then, may we hear Luke's words here in Acts, go on, tell people about Jesus, boldly and without hindrance. Proclaim, live out the kingdom of God. Tell them about Jesus. Amen. a short prayer, and then we'll have our closing hymn. Lord, write Your Word in our hearts today from what I have said, cause what You want to have its effect to be remembered by each one of us, to come back to us, uh, to achieve Your purpose from your word today. In Jesus' name, amen. God is working his purpose out as year succeeds to year.
So let's say the grace to one another. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forevermore. Amen.